Well, good morning again. Uh, again, my name is Steve. I'm one of the pastors here at Hope. We are right now in the uh, fifth week of a series that, of sermons that really are trying to engage with uh, what's our cultural dogmas or things that maybe we don't even realize are being taught to us, are being preached at us, are be, we're being catechized with uh, in some ways from our culture, and uh, our uh, like a gospel response to that. It has been very fun, uh, very much a kid in a candy store, and I've heard from a lot of people that you are really, this is causing a lot of people to think as well. And just to remind you, especially if you're brand new, kind of what our approach is in this is, is we've been looking at uh, a, a narrative or, or some type of thing that is being taught to us, and then we're asking, uh, what should we do with that? And the church historically has went through a variety of ways. Uh, they have isolated themselves from the world. They have fought uh, against it. Uh, they have just syncretized or become exactly like the world. Uh, but what we're trying to do in this uh, series and kind of where hope has set itself up over the years as we engage with cultures, I think there's things definitely we can learn, but we need to believe uh, that the scriptures, that the Bible's true, and that we take these things and we filter them, and the things that stick, we hang on to, and the things that don't go right through, and we don't hang on to them. So that's, that's what we're doing, and today, we're going to talk about a narrative called the history narrative. You're on the wrong side of it, okay? That idea of where this uh, narrative has come from. The narrative basically says something like this. It's a complicated one. In fact, as I looked at it this week, it became a little more complicated, but, uh, and I'll explain that in just a moment, but something like this. It says, we are progressing as a culture, as a nation, as a group of thinkers, whatever. You Christians are way behind the times, and history will prove you wrong, is kind of the, the, the narrative in, in a sense. Uh, and it might not be just Christians. It'd be anyone that doesn't agree with with whatever the current thought is. And so here's the, here's the narrative, or here's kind of understanding it a little bit better. I don't know why. Last week I really got into this, and I have no idea how they figured this out, but this is the amount of usages of this phrase, the wrong side of history. And uh, you can find this on any phrase. I bet you could find your name and see how much it's being used in the last, you know, whatever, 100 years. But you can see that the usage has gone up. It's a little hard to see the numbers there, but that's 1900. It's introduced right in the early 1900s or so. It's actually introduced, most people think, by Karl Marx and some of his thinking about how uh, some of the socialism a Marxism, I, I'm not making a political statement just because I said that word, but the, uh, the, that they would be, bring a new world, it would bring a new history, and that it would make all other history antiquated. And that's when it starts to get introduced. Uh, it fluctuates up and down, uh, but it becomes really popular in American culture, beginning with uh, this guy right here, uh, Ronald Wilson Reagan. And uh, he starts pushing this in 1982. He gives a speech at the British Parliament, and he says these words. The march of freedom and democracy will leave Marxism and Leninism on the ash heap of history. Did he like it? I wasn't sure. No, no, he didn't. He didn't care for it. <laughs> uh, on the ash heap of history, as it has left other tyrannies which stifle the freedom and muzzle the self-expression of the people. So he uses this phrase, ash heap of history. He's actually repeating it from uh, another source. That, that speech starts the narrative of this idea of history and where you're left on it. Bill Clinton then loves the phrase. According to the American Presidency Project, uh, there's actually a thing that counts the number of times in major policy speeches or in State of the Union speeches uh, or in other places that they use this. He used the right side of history, that phrase, 21 times while he was in office. His staffers used it 15 times. And he also loved to use the phrase wrong side of history. But it really becomes popular with Barack Obama. Barack Obama loved this phrase. In fact, the night of his, uh, the night that he is elected president, November 8th, uh, 20, 2008, he gives a speech and he says these words. He goes through a list of things that talk about this, this change that's taking place and he says, it's the answer. And then he 
fills in the blank with, with something. And he says here, it's the answer that led those who have been told for so long by so many to be cynical and fearful and doubtful of what we can achieve to put their hopes on the arc of history and bend it once more toward the hope of a better day. This idea of an arc of history and we're gonna bend it or it's bending towards a hope of a better day. That's actually a quote if you know where that comes from, from Martin Luther King in his famous speech in March of 1965 where he stood on the steps of Alabama, uh, I think it was State House, and he gives his fra- famous speech, Our God is Marching On, and the phrase that he uses is, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. He's actually quoting someone else who's uh, an abolitionist uh, preacher in the 1800s that is quoting this idea. And it, it's, it's a little bit, little bit different, but it's roughly the idea of the, the arc of moral history is long, but it's bending towards, it's going towards this idea of justice, okay? Um, he, also, he also, during the, in, uh, again, one of the most famous times uh, President Obama uses the phrase is on December 6, 2015, when he's talking about terrorism. And he says, my fellow Americans, I am confident we will succeed in this mission because we are on the right side of history. Okay? So, again, he uses it a lot in different, uh, it says here, he uses it 15 times in in public addresses, and 13 times uh, by his staffers referring to a lot of things. All right, now, uh, let's take some assumptions about this phrase. Let's take some assumptions about the phrase uh, while we start to understand what this thing is. There's four major assumptions that the phrase, the wrong side of history, is communicating. Number one, history is progressive and linear, right? If you're on the wrong, there has to be a side to it, and so therefore, there's, there's one side and then there's another side. And, and therefore, it's progressive. It's progressing and it is in a linear fashion. It's not ups and downs and all of it. But it's, there's a side to it. It's like one side of the mountain, the other side of the mountain. Okay? Assumption number two. It is, uh, we're headed to, therefore, we're headed toward a better world than the one we once had. Right? So the, if history is progressive and linear, we are getting better than we were. Third assumption is, the guiding force of history is what the majority or the, those in power would believe. That's what, what this phrase means is, you're on the wrong side of history, would mean what the majority or those in power would now believe at the current time. And the fourth one, this is a little confusing. I changed the wording on this one so many times. Let me just try to explain it. Morality is not subjective in that sense. Okay, and you're going, wait a minute, this is the definition of subjectivism. I I know that. So I'm using this word in the way I want to use it, which is subjective completely. But anyway, what I mean by that is this. Subjective or moral relativism is the idea of you believe what you want, I'll believe what I want, there isn't any real truth. That's not exactly what's being said here. That's not what's being said anymore. That's changed. And so there's this idea of history like a mountain and you're on the opposite side of it and it's morality is now determined and you can be on the right or wrong side and it's determined by this quote unquote history, okay? So that's basically the narrative uh, of this idea and uh, you know, people, I love when people think that they're always, of course, who likes to think, who'd wear a shirt that says I'm on the wrong side of history, right? No one one would would wear that shirt. So, Let's learn and filter this narrative. Let's go back through those four assumptions. Assumption number one, progressive and linear. Now, I am a history freak. I love history. Uh, However, I remember taking at the University of Minnesota way back when, (laughs) that was even history back when I took it, uh, the... We have security, right? <laughs> um, wow. Guy gets a couple gray hairs and people get. <laughs> the first part of the class asks the question what is history? What, what even is history? How does history get written? Who writes it? 
It's complicated. Any history majors here? Any, anybody have a history? I see a couple people. They, they're, okay, so uh, you study this whole thing, and it's like, what exactly is this thing that you claim to have a side to, like a mountain to? Uh, one of the things that I'll have you read if you are a history major is an article, or it's, almost, it's really a book, by a guy, it's 1930s. But everywhere I look, this guy was quoted. His name is Herbert Butterfield, uh, and he writes something called the Whig Interpretation of History, which is a weird way of saying this, but he basically says, those in power write the history. That's the idea. <laughs> and therefore, the history is kind of, it's, it's very speculative. He says this, history is all things to all men. She's at the service of good causes and bad. In other words, she's a harlot and a hireling. And for this reason, she serves, I don't know why, I don't know, history became a her, but it's a, it's a her to him. Uh, best serves those who suspect her most. Therefore, we must beware of even saying, history says, or history proves, as though she herself were the oracle. As though indeed history, once she's spoken, had put the matter beyond the range of mere human inquiry. Rather, we must say to ourselves, she will lie to us till the very end of the last cross examination. <laughs> wow. There's a positive view of everything, right? He's saying you can use this to say anything you want. Anything you want. You can line up history to back up your claim. Second assumption. We're headed toward a better world than the one we once had. And I know we just went through an election cycle, and I know that's what everybody uh, says, and, and, and some folks think that's where we're headed, and some folks wouldn't, and all that kind of thing. And I, if you were to ask yourselves, one of the questions that I know uh, presidential candidates, when they run for their second term, one of the questions they love to have, if the economy's good, is they love to say, are you better off than you were four years ago, right? And so all that kind of a thing. And, and you could say, in the Twin Cities, are we better off than we were five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago? And it matters who you ask, right? So I, I moved down here, uh, to the Twin Cities in the early 1980s, 1982. And Minneapolis in some ways has really changed, really changed. You could say it's been much more positive. But you probably don't know this. If you're an African-American right now in the city of Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota, Minnesota in the whole state is number 49 out of 50 Wisconsin wins. <laughs> Take that, Packer fans. Um, <laughs> according to a study in, in 2017 that says that the inequity between black and white is the worst in Minnesota and Wisconsin. In 2015, a study was put out by the uh, people from the Star Tribune and they found that the median black household in Minnesota is now worse off than its counterpart in Mississippi. We were 45th then. So in two years, we went from 45th to 49th. Yay, us. Matters who you ask when you start asking history is getting better. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of ways it's not getting better. Third, Oh, <clears throat> this is C.S. Lewis, who, this is a very cynical statement, but I, I just like cynics, so this is good. And out of that hopeless attempt has come nearly all that we call human history. Money, poverty, ambition, war, prostitution, classes, empire, slavery. Okay, there's more to history than that, but C.S. Lewis was having a bad day. The, the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which, which will make him happy. Saying, if you just let that unfold, this is what always lands up to be, and we call that human history. Third thing, the guiding force of history is what the majority power believes. And that's true. That's true. So then in 1933, when Adolf Hitler came into power, if you notice, we have an awful lot of uh, artifacts, films, uh, uh, ways of recording the history of Nazi Germany because they thought they were going to win. Because they thought they were going to win, guess who writes the history books? The victors write the history books. And they were going to rewrite all the history books from that way on. And that's the way history seemed to be going until history said they lost World War II. And now 
history celebrates people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Corey Ten Boom, those who were in resistance and paid with their lives or paid with the lives of their family members. So history in and of itself is an awkward thing. Uh, it, has a, it has an opportunity to kind of cur- cur- fix itself, change itself, right? Third one, fourth one. Morality is not subjected but determined by history. Now, the last point kind of proves that, right? In the 19, late 1930s, it was moral to do what they were doing in Nazi Germany with the extermination of people who were not part of the master race, all right? So, but that's kind of how things happen. Then it changes, right? Okay, and I would argue for the better, true. But even in my own lifetime, um, as I think of this, I, I think when I, I first became a follower of Jesus uh, in the early 1980s, and I remember talking to um, my friends, high school friends, about this, and uh, I wasn't any fun anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like we'd go to a bar and I would actually, you might want to write this down, drink alcohol responsibly. Now, that was a new thing. Uh, <laughs> the, the reality is uh, uh, I, I was underage all the times when I got seriously drunk. And then I actually became a follower of Christ before I turned 19. 19 was the legal limit in Minnesota back in those days. And from that point on, I haven't. But So we'd sit in these bars, and of course, they're getting lit up. And what's wrong with you, Trike? And I'd talk about what Christ has done in my life and all that. And, oh yeah, it was great, it was great. Uh, and it is interesting, I'm not gonna lie, having a debate about eternal matters with someone who's, you know, got enough Pap's blue ribbon in them to light, keep, you wanna keep all candles away from them, you know, kind of a deal. But they, we'd start to talk about all kinds of things and I would talk about my ethics and how things had changed in my life in just the few short months that I had met Christ and how I was reading the word and it made sense. And a lot they would push in on was like sexual ethics. And I would look at it and say, yeah, I believe this is what scripture teaches about that. Not, I'm, not, I'm not pushing it on anyone, but this is what I would believe. And they would look at me <clears throat> as a goody two-shoes. That's how I was looked at in the 80s. Now... I'm not looked at as a goody two-shoes. I'm looked at as immoral. My view is restrictive. The gospel of sexual ethic is very, very clear and very, it, it, it involves everybody. And it says there's, there's this current, uh, there's an ethic of how God designed sexuality and that, all of us break that. And people would say, your view is archaic. It's not only archaic, it's oppressive. Not only is it oppressive, it's immoral. That's a change. In, in those years. All right, so with that said, what's the biblical idea of being on the right side of history? Okay? So obviously that phrase is not in the Bible. Can't Google out the right side of history, quotes on, you know, unquote, and find it in the Bible. But our God has a lot to say about what's happening in history. And I wanna land you with, uh, there's uh, four or five things here from scripture that I wanna let you let land here as we try to filter this and learn from it. First point, scripture. God is completely sovereign over human history and always has been, okay? Now, we live in a fallen world. You can, you, you're right, I, I, and, and there are things that happen that God is in control of, but they're not God's will, if, and God's moral will, all right? But his sovereign will, he uses all things, even evil things, uh, for his good, right, and that's a complicated theological thing, not my point today, I wanna say it up front though because I know I'll get people who ask that question, that is what he's saying, but for God to be haphazardly like, uh-oh, uh-oh, what's going on, that's not the picture in scripture at all. Isaiah 46, remember the former things, those of long ago, I am God and there is no other, I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, What is still to come, I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. From the east I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, 
that I will do. So everything happens in God's sovereign will. Please, hear it clearly. Not everything is according to God's moral will. There's bad things that happen that are against God's moral will. But his sovereign will over control of all things, he's in control of history. He's in control of things. Second thing, he appoints, it says he even points places and times and political boundaries. This is the apostle Paul, and he's speaking to people who have no idea about the Bible at all. These are folks that they're just, they're, they're pagan people in uh, Greece, and he's there, and he's gonna explain to them about who this God is, and he says this, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. That's a new thing to, to them. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he mar marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. So he's using all these things so that people would say, reach out to God. It says that God uses all things like that, even, even tough things, right? I'm not saying I totally get that. I don't understand it. But God's in control of it. God, uh, so they'd seek him and, and uh, reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, and he's quoting their own poetry, we are his offspring. That's the Apostle Paul trying to explain who this God is. Now, on the question, does history get better? Scripture would say yes and no. Okay, here's some examples of no. Jesus is speaking, and he says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. So there's, Jesus is speaking of a time when there will be an increase of wickedness, not a decrease of wickedness. I'm not, I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer here, but there, there, is, there are times where there are increases of wickedness. Jesus even says to his disciples, he warns them, he says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. But I'm just telling you, if you don't have a good understanding, a good doctrine of suffering and understanding that we don't live where we are created to live, we don't live in the Garden of Eden, we live in a, in a place that has sin and death and crime and racism and all kinds of different things that should not be here and we are here and we're not created for that and it's not gonna ever get right in this world. The Apostle Paul even goes on to talk about in, in 2 Thessalonians 2, and you can look at more of this, but I'm just gonna take this one section. He talks about a time actually coming where this, this lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. Like, there's gonna come a time where it's just chaos. Not sure exactly a theologian disagree about what time period he's talking about, whether it was a period in that lifetime or whether it was something coming in the future, but he's just trying to get them used to the idea that history may lead to much harder times. If you were alive in 1933 at the rise of Adolf Hitler, it would be very difficult to look at this Bible and not think we are in the very end of all days, right? It just was like, oh my gosh, this is the tyranny that is described in Scripture, the lawless one. It could be. Now, one of the other things as we look at the idea of a shifting morality is to look at what God thinks about that. And the interesting thing to me, just from a, 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 just from a very simple study, is to look at Genesis. In Genesis chapter one, it is God and God alone, the one who looks at things and says good, not good, right? If you look in Genesis 1, he creates all these different things, and he says, he looked at it, and he said, it's good. He looks at that, and he says it was good. And when he gets done, uh, it says in Genesis 1, God saw that all he had made, and it was, and he says, very good. And there was evening, and there was morning on the sixth day. In fact, if you uh, even look what uh, God communicates to Adam, 
at this point in time, it's just Adam. And uh, it says, the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. You have free will, Adam, any tree, go after it. But you must not eat from one tree. Which one? The knowledge of good and evil. That's, 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 I define good and evil, Adam. You do not. And that is not for you. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. God is the one who declares what is good and what is not good. And what gets us into the entire mess that we're in is Adam and Eve uh, decide that they will shift gears, and they want to be the ones that decide. You can see Genesis 2, I forgot about this one, pardon me. Uh, he looks at Adam and says, this is something that's not good. It's not good that Adam's alone, and he'll make and help or sort of form, he creates Eve. What happens is, when humans take that role, they want to take on the role of defining morality. Not determining it and trying to understand it, that is our role, but defining it. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, there it is, of what's the wisdom, the knowledge of good and evil. I will now not need God for that. I can do that on my own, thank you. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. They realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So, this whole idea of the right side of history is there are biblical uh, a framework to that that makes us think, what exactly is history? Now, <clears throat> is it all gloom and doom? No. We would hold that the scripture story can be divided into four big storylines. There was creation where God created the world good he created it the way we were designed to live there, and, and only two people for a very short period of time get to live there, Adam and Eve, until second part, the fall. Sin enters the world. Things are not the way they're supposed to be. And if anyone wants to look at the problem of evil and how there can be a good God, you've got to first start by saying, we were not designed for here. This is not what we were designed for. So he's saying, how can there be bad things in a world if God is good? That's because we made it that way. There are not bad things in this world. There are, I don't know why I'm moving a little bit, but I am. There are bad things, and the camera guy's like, stop it. Anyway, uh, sorry, Hope West. There are, there, are, there are bad things here. And if Genesis 3 makes clear anything, it says because of Adam and Eve. They're the ones that did it. So if you want to be an atheist and don't believe in God because bad things happen here, be an atheist and don't believe in Adam and Eve. They did it. That doesn't make any sense, but whatever. So <laughs> moves over here to where God doesn't give up on his humanity. He starts a redemption plan. That redemption plan starts from day one with Adam and Eve, follows through, goes through the Old Testament, and is really made known in Jesus Christ. He is the Savior of the world. He ultimately is the one who will go to a cross and pay for this sin problem we have to create a situation where we can, in, if it was a circle, but I don't have that ability, go to restoration, which in essence is Going back to the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> That's what we want every morning I wake up and say, I just want the Garden of Eden. And now being 54, when I wake up and I sit up, it takes a little while to get everything in line. Right? That's not gonna happen in the Garden of Eden. I'm just gonna sit up and go, glory. <laughs> All right? So that's the storyline that we have. That's the biblical arc of history. And what I want to do to close today is I want, what's going to happen in the future, exactly what it's going to look like, I don't know exactly. But I want to tease you a little bit. Or as the famous theologian Nacho Libre said, give you a little taste. 
Anyway. <clears throat> there's a scene from, there's a scene from uh, the movie The Wizard of Oz where the, the wizard and the, the one that kind of explains this whole situation is behind a curtain and he's, and he's moving things, right? And Toto, the dog, pulls the curtain back and you get to see in to the curtain and even though you're looking at the guy right there and it's just a guy pulling strings, he's not the big wizard, it's just some guy, he says, pay no, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. And, and, I, and I like that analogy in one sense because I think there's a spot in scripture where the curtain is pulled back and we get a little look, it's not some little guy, it's actually God himself, but we get a little look at what's gonna happen in the future. So I wanna close today by looking at the God of history. I wanna look at this, the curtain of human history. And I want to close by looking at uh, the book of Revelation, chapters four and five. The book of Revelation was written by a man by the name of John. Uh, we're not exactly sure who John is. Uh, some scholars think it's uh, the, the apostle John, the same one that wrote the gospel of John and others, and some think it's a different guy. We're not sure exactly. But he uh, writes this book, and it's written to reveal Jesus Christ and to encourage people who are going through suffering that they're gonna be able to move towards a new day. That one day, <coughs> pardon me, one day, everything will be made right. And that's, he's talking about what that's going to look like. In chapters one and beginning of two, they have some introduction, then he gives seven letters to the churches, and then we get this glimpse in chapters four and five of what's going on in the heavenlies, all right? So here's what happens. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what may take place after this. At once, I was in the spirit. Okay, so again, uh, I'm just gonna lay my cards down. There's a lot from the book of Revelation we can go, that's really cool. And there's a lot from the book of Revelation that makes it sound like, was marijuana illegal back then when he wrote this? I'm just, <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. I, and so it's, there's some of that, okay? Granted, that's a form of literature called apocalyptic literature that just makes it sound a little bit that way. We're gonna just try to figure out what we can figure out, all right? So here we go. <coughs> Excuse me. There before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting in it. Imagery. Throne. Someone sitting. King, all right? And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, a rainbow re uh, resembling an emerald uh, encircled the throne. A rainbow looking like an emerald. How do you like that emerald? Pretty cool, huh? Uh, surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, okay? Some of this you can put in your mind, and in a little while it's gonna like, I have to stop that because it just got weird. I get it. There's this imagery of these other thrones. Seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne, the center throne, came flashes of lightning, rumbles, rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. People think this could be like the sevenfold understanding of the Holy Spirit, the seven things it does. It could be seven angels. We're not sure. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Okay, get it? So there's this huge sea. It's, it, looks like, it looks like glass. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes. That's where you just want to stop thinking about what this actually looks like. Anyway, uh, in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, strong. Second was like an oak. It has service. The third was a face like a man. It has intelligence. And the fourth was like a flying eagle. In other words, it, is, um, it has swiftness or can go all over the place. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was with, covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Please don't draw this, okay? It starts to get a little weird. Day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, always was, who is and who is to come. Or in other words, I could just say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who just is. 
always is. He's always in the is. Bad English, good theology. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and they say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you created all things. You're the creator of all things. And by your will, they were created and have their being. Createdness, God's control, and the beingness of everything is in God's hands. All of that is nothing more than just the setting to chapter five. Chapter five. Then I saw on the right hand of him who sits on the throne a scroll, scroll with writing on both sides, and it was sealed with seven seals. Now, who knows? It looks like that or not. Just the concept, it's a scroll. Uh, what was this? If a king were, were to have a document and it was sealed, it would be an edict. It would be something that they are going to enact. It could be a title to property. It could be uh, laws that they want enacted. It could be the will of, of, you know, a personal will that after they were to pass away, what was to happen? This is an edict of some kind, and they would seal it. And when they sealed that, it actually contains the wishes of the king, but it actually doesn't take place until it is opened, right? You have the will, but you don't have anything that takes place place. This seal, this, the, excuse me, this scroll is the will of God for the future to be that unveiling when all things will be renewed and will be brought back to the Garden of Eden, new heavens and new earth. That's what this will is. That's what this scroll is, and it has seals on it. And somebody of importance has to open the seals. So, I saw a mighty angel proclaiming a loud voice. Who's worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? Crickets. No one speaks. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside it's not going to happen. I, 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 there's no one worthy enough to open this, this scroll, so it can't happen. The way God designed it to happen, it's not going to happen. We're not going to get to restoration. And then one of the elders, the Scottish elder, says to him, could you cry, lad? <laughs> See the lion of the tribe of Judah? The road of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven sails. Right? He says, there is someone. And look, where the, look, look at all the imagery here. So this is going to get weird. It's, it's, it, he, he, he's a lion, and in a minute he's going to be a lamb. You can do that in the book of Revelation. That's okay. Don't draw a picture, because people have had like a lion head and a lamb head. It doesn't, not two heads. It's a lion and a lamb at the same time. It's imagery. We get to do it. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing where? In the center of the throne. Whew. There's so much theology in that sentence. There's a lamb, sacrificial lamb. He had been slain. And where is he standing? In the God spot. He himself is God. God sacrifices himself encircled by four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each had a harp. It's actually, the original Greek says, electric guitar. And they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song, and they sing it to the Lamb. You are worthy to take the scroll and open, open its seals. Why? Because you were slain. That's the pinnacle of history, 
right there. You were slain, and with your blood, you purchased for men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen. And once again, those poor elders fell down and worshiped. And then chapter six starts. And the first thing chapter six says, Jesus, the lamb that was slain, the lion of the tribe of Judah, opens the first seal. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the right side of history. Everything else is details. That's the right side of history. That's our God who's in control of all things. So as we close here and as we spend some time uh, reflecting through songs here as to close, I want to ask you a simple question Are you on the right side of history? Are you on the right side of that story? Has Jesus Christ so enamored you that it is all about that story? Or as some have said, his story. And secondly, and it's been happening for 2,000 years plus, are you okay with being judged as if you weren't? Let's pray together. God of all history, we do in fact praise you because of who you are and what you've done. And though there are so many things in our lives that make us have aches and pains, there's so much injustice in the world. And Lord God, we'll fight for that. At the same time, God, we trust you as the Lord of history, the sovereign one, the one who brings joy to our heart. So I pray, Lord God, or even in, in a room this size, I, I ask that every, every single person here at Hope West or maybe listening to this message at a later time, I pray right now that we would be on the right side of, of your history that that would be the most important thing to us. So do that, God, in our hearts, even as we close now with songs of worship to you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.